Thank you so much, Alex and Claire, for having me here in Manchester Literature Festival, uh, especially in the great company of music and pictures. I'm going to read three poems. Uh, a poet, a, a sonnet sandwich, as I'm thinking of it, two uh, very long stretched out prose poems and uh, a sequence of disappointed sonnets, as I call them, 13 line sonnets in the middle. And I'm just going to read straight through. Mon Amour The university had begun to compile lists of all human remains on its premises, not just in university collections, including ancient remains. An email arrived in my inbox asking for the following. Please can you send me information on materials less than 100 years old, includes bone, teeth, hair, skin, nails, saliva, i.e. collected for DNA analysis, etc., etc. The email explained that this list needed to comply with the Human Tissue Act guidelines for the university's annual return. If I was unsure how to report this and the details required, I was to contact the designated individual for the Human Tissue Authority, Dr. Risk. I had dreamt of the bomb, his face crawling through the flames, that afternoon, I gave up trying to keep up with the emails and closed the curtains. The room felt dark and cool and I flicked through my library of DVDs. In Casablanca, Humphrey Bogart smiled, the crinkles of tiredness under his eyes like a way into another world. Jimmy Stewart was peering from the case of Rear Window, where Grace Kelly, perpetually beautiful, moved forever towards him in her black and white dress. Emmanuel Weaver gazed out, distraught from the arms of A.G. Okada on the case of Hiroshima on a moor. He is looking at you. In my half-awake state, the films intertwined. Over the road in the drama school, the musical theatre students were practicing their end-of-year performance. On the top floor, actors were rehearsing sword fights. From my bedroom, with a pair of birding binoculars, I would have been able to experience the fight almost as if I were in the same room. A lone voice sang out, resonant, full of something I could only call optimism. Drowsily, my mind flitted across the lines of song. At night, the building was lit up and towered over the line of Georgian terraces like an oversized Greek temple. My neighbour had installed a camera in his window box. It sat there like a cyclops or an unnamed octopus, severely tied to an artificial rose between a blotch of purple and yellow pansies. I was not exactly sure what the neighbour was watching out for, and it seemed that there was no law against the camera being there. Its infrared eye blinked frequently, monitoring my steps and the steps of my visitors up and out of the house. One morning, I took a photograph of it on my mobile phone. Blink. I didn't want my friends to think I had succumbed to paranoia. Sometimes small packets were missing <coughs> to my house, and I reposted them back through his letterbox. The man who lived the other side of the house stopped me in the street one day and told me I was a disgrace to my profession. I was not even sure he knew what I did. Later he wrote me an unsigned letter, reinforcing my need for personal shame, insisting I cut down the tree in my backyard which towered across the rooftops. All afternoon I lay there in an old vest and pants with my hair tied up on the top 
of my head, watching the dark fall and running films back to back. I watched Miss Torso and Miss Lonely Heart and dangled my limbs over the edge of the sofa. I watched dust fall on bodies as dust became sweat. The man's body and the woman's body were indistinguishable. Outside, the smell of dope and beer and the cathedral bells all knotted up together. The dealers hung around, smoking on the drama school steps. Nobody called, and the street seemed preternaturally empty. Not for the first time did I think how glad I was of summer and its showers and breezes. Yet, all the landscapes I held within me seemed to be receding. I watched as the two naked bodies moved intimately on the screen and remembered that whole day in the attic room and the window that opened onto apple trees, mom and mom. She, I saw the newsreels, I saw them on the first day, on the second day, on the third day. He, interrupting her, you saw nothing, nothing. The screen flickered. It was hard to look at the piles of bodies, the skin, the hair, the bones. I thought about truth and I thought about lies. I thought about love and all its erasures. Knowing that desire was a series of chemical and neuronal firings better accustomed me to the dead feeling at my centre. I thought about desire and how it made the body something other than itself. I thought about the outlines of bodies at crime scenes and the permeability of the skin that created such an unstable outline to the self. I thought about the soldiers who had returned from war with lost limbs and eyes. I thought about the perpetual loop of trauma. I thought, for no reason I could fathom, of Werner Forsman, the scientist who pushed 65 centimetres of catheter through his body and then took an x-ray to prove that it was in his heart. From the edges of my vision, I was sure I saw a wolf slip with its yellow eyes from behind the bookcase to the room next door. I didn't want to check. The room was filled with a strange scent. Then, the doorbell rang. The screen flickered. Skin. Bones. A doctor had said to me, we will watch and wait. Something I knew was only beginning. Something I knew was at an end. In memoriam. Sometimes at Easter we'd drive west, stopping makeshift at our curious stations, once to put a bet on a horse, once slowed behind a whole village, a man dragging a man-sized cross. Now Easter is come round again, and I stand once more by a restless log. Your body's ashes drift, Carol, Corrib, the shores of Carol Moor. A landscape has become a conversation. Mountains, godlike, touch my godlessness. Carl Patrick, stained by pilgrims' feet. Darling, what did I leave when we left you, where sky and water meet? An old love is a kind of promise. In the first rush of new unholy orders, there's a wish to make a body limitless. Now here's the longing for my breast to meet a mouth, for you again to slip your hands inside my heart and with a turn of limbs to bring a rhyme of colour.
to my cheek. I'll hoot, fox call, a phone rings in a distant house. How to be one in this strange equation? We drive together in the dark. I mark a simple prosody in making tea. Later, in each other's ghostly arms, the radio will sing us both asleep. The bed is drenched with sweat. Beyond the sunshine and the open windows, I name the birds who draw an endless song. I see us now reflected in that mirror. You lift me up, we hold each other down. Is it too much, you ask, not letting go? You stack up logs beside the fire, bind up our cottage beams in mistletoe. And how could my body not cry out harmonics of our loveliness? Your voice sits in my mobile phone. It was our perfect happiness to make yourself my own. <coughs> I drifted into trees. The arborist's banter when I ask him how he came to this. He names ash, alder, silver birch, trees that would suit this backyard better. Tells me to listen to the family of wrens who've nested in the neighbor's eaves. What would I give to become this Daphne, rooted and evergreen, desire doubling each year in awkward growth beneath the seagull's melancholy bleat? In the next door yard, a flock of green finches, like leaves, take flight. Their gorgeous, synchronous songs are torment. The common laurel, which I plan to fell, today can stand for love this hell. I raise from YouTube the songs of birds. Skylark, <coughs> nightingale. Play them teaching to a sleepy class. On my desk are letters, birds' nests from the garden, blackbird, linnet, song thrush, robin. <coughs> Would you know, I ask, what keeps me, Claire, matching a bird to a pattern of yellow, taking a stanza from form to flight? To be twenty and begin again. To love madly and for so long. Hairs rise like golden feathers up my arm. Love in the dreamy reaches of our brains. Your absence asks if love was ever wrong. House of the singing winds. At the foot of the sugarloaf, blackthorn spikes and bribes the hedgerows. Crows gather in the awkward fields. Now grief is written in their dark alignments. Sorrow in a nearby field of horses. In an absent moment, I can still look up to see you there, call out in sleep, or, fall, or pull two glasses from the press. Daily text messages erase. I turn my back on you until you leave. I'm relearning the metrics of being alone. I cannot show you the English gardens, now you are gone. Not the magnolia tree breaking extravagantly open. <coughs> Not cyclamen, narcissus, <coughs> or delphinium. The fiery tulips with their mouths soft spillage. A liturgy of spring that steers to summer. Foxglove, rose, Peony, geranium, as I sit here with our son. The stepping stones steal through the glass. The tilting water clock that measured out my childhood's bone. I put myself to my own test. It is a prayer demanding answer. Asks what I would be warden of. Perfection in execution. A repetition like desire. Here is the joy of shifts and modulations. Bach's cello sweeps demanding our attention. Like anything, I say you have to practice love. 
Now I have missed the sight of us together, watching a thousand field fairs smear the February air. Were I to practice love again, I'd hold the memory of the morning hand in hand as we watched a fledgling robin open up its throat beside the river. Bach's cello suites shout out for my attention as March now runs to April. I hear a robin song, remembering how down empty lanes a thousand field fairs, so it seemed, rose up to splinter winter's air. Eyes to the right, nose to the left. I had heard wrong. Someone was weeping, but I couldn't tell where the sound was coming from. The expression took me back to my childhood and an eagle eyes action man who had a little serrated switch at the back of his head. You moved your hand against the mechanism embedded into the fuzz of his crew cut, and there the eyes moved to the left, to the right. You dressed him in combat gear. He was your brother's dog. When you wanted him to play with Cindy, something went wrong with the proportions. Cindy's huge head and breasts and feet that looked like they had been bound did not play well alongside him. They each came from a different universe. Her long nylon locks, his long fuzzy head. It made sense to keep things apart. In error, on my 11th birthday, an elderly relative had given me a book of short stories. It had been an honest mistake, but the stories were not meant for a child. There was a picture of a doll's house on the front. Unlike Cindy and Eagle Eyes, the dolls and the book were designed to populate all the little fitting together pieces of plastic. I remember when my daughter was only two, how we had flown from right to left across the world, and how in the dark, looking down from the plane windows, all we could see beneath us were the blazing fires, oil on water as we crossed the gulf. I remembered, as every day I remembered. Everything came thick and fast. I remember the girl at school who'd been on Jim will fix it. I'd written to go on the show too. I wanted to be an astronaut. Light, light as air. My friend came to school wearing a badge. Jim fixed it for me. The ribbon was watermarked and the metal was heavy as it hung secretly under her school shirt. She'd wanted to play a one-man band. I remember Sabal's face and his hair and his chair and his laugh and how he had been a friend of Thatcher. Now he was the nation's ghostly shame. Had it really been a simpler life? Now everywhere was nowhere. Everywhere there was division. The country had been split in half. Politicians were speaking narratives that had never seen more, seemed more unreal in their dissimulation. <coughs> Words meant nothing. Mother of all bombs was in fact a massive ordnance air blast. Today, in the papers, there were pictures of the Prime Minister holding the hand of the President. What was going on? Would there be a warning, some kind of instruction? I waited for the letter to come to tell me what to do. I wanted to keep all the little bits and pieces of plastic out of the narrative. I said to you over and over in my head things that needed to be said. I drifted and bobbed in a coracle of sleepless nights. Not for the first time I felt entirely on my own and my actions I see only in retrospect suggested I had lost all self-governance. Mon amour. 
That first Christmas we had stayed in a house not far from the lighthouse. Boats slipped across the horizon as if they were sailing across not sea but land. The landscape held church, castle. A building from where the world service had been broadcast was a square, temporary smudge on the left. Wind blew eddies of sand through a row of pagoda-like buildings where the detonators for the atom bomb had first been tested. As the coast eroded, the lighthouse would topple from the shingle into the sea. Recently, it had been decommissioned, and the mercury in which the lens of its great cyclopean eye rested had already been removed. When I stood looking out from the shoreline, I felt I was standing on the edges of the world, like that time in Hobart, looking out. Except now the edges, like the body's extremities, were breaking off. My body still carried within it what it felt like when I held your hand. One night, before we had even met, you had taken a train across Europe and drunk beer with a group of travelling actors in a town square where the train had paused for an hour. Unused to the dark, the beer, the heaviness of the experience, you had fallen, your hand like a red hole <coughs> on a field of broken glass. I could feel a little line of scars like a string of fairy lights light up in my palm. Or perhaps I had misremembered that. I lay in the dark without you, remembering my fingers moving across the scars like brown. I remembered the train journey through the night I had made myself from Valencia to Paris, a relic in the cathedral in Valencia. Somebody's hand or finger, somebody's revealed bones. I remembered the Serbian widow on the journey weeping as I lay on my haversack trying to sleep beside her on the carriage floor. As the years passed, I had become more and more a stranger to myself. Hung, drawn and quartered, a sliver of moon emerged from the dark sky. I felt the warm, wet threads of tears on my cheeks. Listen, I said. Every day decisions are being made. Eyes to the left, eyes to the right. Yet poetry stood very still. Go on, I said. I'm talking to you, Irato. Go on yourself, she said. Look up. <laughs>